Are you considering having an aesthetic procedure performed? Confused by all the information out there? Welcome to It's a Young Thing, where Nurse Paula Young arms you with the knowledge on all things cosmetic and aesthetic. And now, Nurse Paula Young. Hey everyone, it's Nurse Paula Young. Welcome back to another episode of It's a Young Thing podcast on the Living Sage Plastic Surgery Network. And I'm really fortunate to have a really good friend of mine that I'm excited to have on. I was saving this topic for him, Dr. Craig Zaring of Zaring Medical. And Craig is the rock star of hair transplantation and hair restoration. He has offices located in Beverly Hills, Newport Beach, California, Las Vegas, Chicago, and also New York City, very close to me here in Pennsylvania. So Dr. Zaring, uh, he's affectionately referred to as Dr. Z. That's what everybody calls him, his friends and his colleagues. And he he's esteemed faculty of a lot of educational institutions, and he trains physicians from all over the world world and the latest technologies in hair restoration techniques. So welcome to It's a Young Thing, Dr. Zering. I'm so happy to have you. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm really honored. Thank you. You're welcome. And you know, today I want to really dispel the myths of hair restoration for a lot of people. There's so many different techniques out there and people get them confused. You know, they see this full head of hair, but they have no idea the scars that are involved, the downtime that's involved, and also the new technologies that actually you helped develop and were a pioneer in a lot of this new technology. I really want to get to that last topic. So first of all, let's start at how hair transplantation was done, I would like to say, in the archaic days. So in the the very beginning, it actually uh, was discovered by the Japanese, and they were doing hair transplants for trauma, and they actually started doing it for eyelash and eyebrow trauma, and then it, it kind of got really quiet, and then in the United States, one of the dermatologists was working with vitiligo and found that when they were moving these punch grafts, that actually the hair, if they moved a hair-bearing area, it would grow hair, and so after that, the first hair transplant was done in the U.S., for actually male pattern or genetic hair loss, and those were punches. And so that it was just fascinating that the fact that we could move hair and it would grow. And the the patient was both the donor and the recipient of these grafts. And if you think back 40 years ago or so, uh, you remember there was these doll hair. People would talk about the plugs, yeah. um, the, the big groupings. And Aesthetically, they, they didn't look great, but but it was just amazing that we could move hair from one area to, to the next and it would grow. And so we started with large punches and these punches would be six millimeters in size. And that's kind of like an eraser tip to give someone a perspective. And they could have 12 or 16 hairs in them and you'd punch them out of the back of the head, leave that area open and it would close by secondary intention, and then you'd move them into the front, and you'd actually kind of do grids, um, you know, boxes and rows, and kind of line them up. There wasn't a lot of artistry with it. It was more mathematical. And over time, we started to make the graphs smaller and smaller, so we cut them in half and then into quarters. Then over time, two things happened. One was we realized that when we were taking these out of the back in punches, that we could actually cut in between them and actually take the whole thing out and do a W plasty. So close the back of the head. And so it would heal a lot quicker and only have one linear scar and instead of what would look like Swiss cheese or bullet holes in the back of someone's head. And that improved the, the back area. And that led to the strip surgery or what we call FUT. And so instead of doing punches all over the place, we would take a strip of tissue somewhere between one centimeter or uh, 1.2 in width, and it could be as little as as 0.8. And we would take it from the safe donor area, which would be the area in the back of the head that's not destined to be lost, so somewhere around the, the ears. And that hair, we could take that strip out, and we could cut those grafts up to the size that we wanted. So we could make one, two, or three haired grafts if we wanted to, and put them into little incisions or little holes that we made in the front of the head and get a more natural look. Well, that's the beginning of the FUT or strip graft. But with that, the next development was the the use of the microscope. And the use of the microscope, when we looked at those hairs, we actually found out that those hairs actually grow as one, two, and three haired follicular units, all the way up to four. And a follicular unit meant it's the number of hair follicles along with the sebaceous gland. So they together is how it's a natural grouping. Other than that, you heard in the beginning, we had big groupings 
you know, the, the, the six millimeter punch, then we cut them in half. Then we just did micro and mini graphs, which were, we were telling our staff, cut me a one hair graft or a two hair graft or a three hair graft. But we didn't recognize that there were actual units. So now if you look at the back of the head and, and we'll show you this so that you can see it on the screen, you can actually see that hairs are in groups of ones, twos, threes, and fours. And now we divide them under the microscope into exactly those same natural units. In doing so, the back looks nice with just a small, you know, a linear line that should be thin. And then we make the incisions in the front of the scalp anywhere that there's thinning or balding tissue, and we can create a more natural design and you're getting more natural groupings. And so that really was the beginning of the microscopic follicular unit grafting, and that was the FUT or what, what you would call the strip procedure. Right. Now, take a breath. So the strip procedure, even today, is still very valuable and works well. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate, but marketing companies or companies that sell instrumentation sometimes mislead the public because they've got to sell something and they want to make the thing that they're selling look great and the thing that if you don't use that device or don't use something, look bad. And sometimes that's misleading to the public. And our job as physicians, and, and I appreciate what you're trying to do, is to educate the public on, on what's the real facts. And I think that's why it's important that we do this. So keep in mind, and we'll talk specifically about it later, although I use some of the greatest new technology, that the strip procedure or FUT in the right hands, the right surgeon, is still a great procedure for some patients. Now, remember how we talked about the the big punches in the back of the head right. that looked like Swiss cheese. Right. Well, believe it or not, that was the beginning. Of, you know, that's kind of like the precursor of the FUE, follicular unit excision. So that what happened? Those were six millimeters. Well, today we use one millimeter punches all the way down to a 0.7 millimeter punch, and we take them out one at a time, one unit at a time, and we can do that with various different instruments. There's a handheld device, and then there's some devices that use suction to assist us in uh, excising and then extracting the tissue. And there's even robotic devices, the artist system, to help us with, with harvesting the graft and excising them. The advantages of doing that is that you can do this and not create any linear scar. So people that want to wear their hair really short can do so with without having any linear scars. Although, it's not perfect for everyone. So you have to keep in mind that someone who maybe just has a little bit of hair in the back here or a, a smaller rim, and you've seen those, sometimes you, you call it like the monk look. When, when you're doing FUE, that extraction at one at, a time, one at a time, you need a larger donor zone to go through because you, you extract 15 to 20% at a time. And therefore, if you do the math, and since the hair is not the same density throughout the entire zone, you're going to need seven or eight times the square centimeters of area. So the patient has to have a big donor zone. So, and you have to shave that area to actually harvest. There are ways to get around that, but if you want a significant harvest, you're going to really have to shave the area all so, in the back of the head. So if I could just interrupt you real quick. So sure. the, the negative advertising you're talking about, I know what you're talking because like all over TMZ and some of these shows, they show stuff stars that are on the beach or in the ocean and they show this big yeah. scar on the back of their head and they're saying oh look who had a hair transplant and they really blow that out of proportion yeah and a lot of times like if you go on an airplane they'll show you five scars in the back of the head and it's just not the way it's done anymore right you know and, and that would be the equivalent of saying to someone you know with the fue today you know the the nice fue that they're selling with the various machines or even the robot that would be the equivalent of showing yesterday's big plugs with swiss cheese in the back of the head because it's not the same thing. And it's all so marketing. It's, like, it's yeah, all it's marketing. Not, it's not fair. Right. So, but the FUE is great for people that want to keep their hair short. For very young patients who may not want to do this, you know, continue to do this, are going to shave their heads because they don't have that linear scar. But for someone that has um, their hair at just a little bit of a length, you know, a, a two or a three on the clippers, most of the time you're not going to see any scar. And there's also things – like scalp micropigmentation today, which is like a, a similar to a superficial tattoo, except these are natural inks. We blend the colors to match the, the, the scalp with the hair color, and they actually evaporate over time. Instead of like where a tattoo goes from black to blue or green and is permanent and looks really bad and so forth. So there's so many things that we can do today to help patients that 
you really need to give them a, a you know a short and a long term plan for the hair loss because hair loss is progressive and it works great and we actually will augment some patients who just don't have enough donor we can we can transplant in this area but, but we can decrease the contrast of the skin color of the scalp with the hair because the light shines through right. and you can actually pigment that in so you can get a combination procedure which is really really nice and works very well for patients. So, you know, that's one of the procedures that we do for men and for women, not just in the scar of the back of the head. And, you know, we're gonna talk about this later, but, you know, we transplant the the eyebrows all the time. We do that in combination with, with the microblading as well sometimes, and we do it surgically in our office so that we can use anesthetic, and we can do it with, you know, the doctor designing the eyebrows so that we get the proper placement, we make sure the angulation is right, and, and they're actually little strokes, that look like hair. So, you know, the, the techniques and the technology always seems to get better and seems to improve. And that's what I love about the field. We're not satisfied with the status quo. We're always trying to make things better for our patients, whether it be the result or the experience. And and that's why FUE comes into play. Uh, and, and you can get some really, really nice results for patients. But in general, when, when you're deciding between these two procedures, there, there are several factors that you look at. If you're going to keep your hair really short or you want the option of shaving your head or you're going to do a relatively small session and you're really young, you generally want to do FUE, okay? The, the removing one at a time. Right. If, if the patient's scalp is really tight because if there's tension on a wound and you try to cut out a strip, it, it's not only going to be uncomfortable for a long period of time, but you can get a large, you know, a larger scar. You can stretch more. If you've had multiple strip procedures and you're going to go into an area that you wouldn't want to expose – then you can do the FUE. So often we com can combine it. If there's a patient that, that has a small area of donor in the back of their head, but it's very, very dense, well, they're going to be a better candidate to get 100% of that sweet spot by cutting that whole zone out and cutting that under the microscope and transplanting that area. And if someone wants the maximum number of grafts over time, we tell them to do the strip first. Then in their second procedure, if there's still elasticity, we take the same scar out, so they still only have one scar. Then we pigment that in with the scalp micropigmentation, and then we do FUE. And that will help to maximize the number of grafts available to a given patient. So, so your that, patients that's can have a couple treatments. Your, your patients, yeah. So they come in in series. They'll do one section at a time and slowly work on the areas that are, are balding. Yeah, it really depends. You know, if, a, if, if a patient is bald already, they want to maximize the number of grafts that we do uh, in one sitting. And you want to do primarily the front first. You want to make sure you get a nice hairline and you work on the front zone because that's what most people see 90, 95% of the time. Once you're comfortable with that density, you can move to the back of the head. Now, there's some patients that you know are pretty mature, already have their pattern established and only have a bald spot in the back. Well, that's when we use a design that, that was named after me that we created on how you recreate the whirl or the bald spot called the Zeering Whirl. But it's the design that we use to maximize the restoration of the back of the head using the least amount of grafts possible so that we get the best aesthetic result. Because we're using a real small per percentage of hairs. We have about 100,000 hairs on our head. A big grafting session is going to be between, you know, 2,500 grafts and 3,000 or, you know, 4,000 grafts max. So you can see there's a big discrepancy in the numbers, but it's just like being creative and artistic with um, a bouquet of flowers, right? Uh, you know, it's how you design it, how you arrange it, the angle, direction, orientation, the distribution of that. Uh, that's what makes the hair transplant look really good. Plus it gives you the appearance of more hair by the way you angle it and feather it into various zones. So it, it's really creative and you can you can hear I've been doing this for 28 years now. I'm going to get so excited just talking about the you know the opportunity because every patient, you know, we're fortunate enough to 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 actually have a positive effect on their life and and it's great and my staff and I love doing it. Well, can you tell our listeners some things that they should look for when they're looking for a physician to do hair transplant surgery? Because this is very precise and you have a lot of very specific organizations that hold you to really, you know, high criteria. So what yeah, should they I, look I, out for? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, the social media and the things like this with the Internet and people being able to get a lot of information out there is really good. But then it makes it difficult for people to 
ascertain you know who really is is good at what they're doing because everyone sounds good or everyone can show here are a few really good before and after pictures and so forth but you really want to try to find someone who specializes in hair restoration so that this is what they do every day that means that they're going to be focused on it they're going to first diagnose and make sure that it's you know the appropriate uh, diagnosis for you that it is a male or female genetic hair loss. They want you want to make sure you don't have some kind of inflammatory disease that might need some other treatment. Right. Um, you want to make sure you don't have one of these, you know, telogen effluviums or shedding diseases or uh, s- situations where the hair can actually come back with another treatment zone and another treatment rather than, an, you know, a hair transplant. So you got to make sure that the treatment is appropriate based on the diagnosis. But you want to go to someone who does this on a regular basis because their staff is going to be very much in tune with not only the best techniques but the patient experience. They want to make sure that from the the first time you contact their office, everyone's on the same page with what is the best option and treatment for you and you get all the alternatives because a lot of patients can do very well with just medical therapy. And and, and I always say with a transplant. Sometimes patients come to me and say, I want to do a transplant. I won't do any of the other stuff because I, you know, I just want it done and over with. Well, if you still have existing hair, remember, hair loss can be progressive. So the transplant puts hair where it's thinning or where it's not, but it doesn't do anything to prevent further loss. And that's why we need to do some of these treatments like finasteride if you're a male, um, which, which blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT. And DHT is that bad actor that makes the hair fall out or a topical preparation that, that consists of minoxidil. We have a combination product called Z82, but minoxidil is the base of that, and that helps to thicken the hairs and hold on to the existing hairs. And then also laser therapy that can be done you know, at home um, to also maximize the results. Then there's good supplements such as Viviscal and others that work well to provide the appropriate nutrients. But you need to know what things to do, and of course, PRP is another hot topic that everyone talks about, platelet-rich plasma. But when you're drawing that blood, spinning it down, we like to add A-cell. There's several things that you can add to it as substrates for the growth factors. But people have to keep in mind that it's a temporary solution. And you don't hear that that often. You don't hear that this is something that you've got to keep on doing. So by adding the substrate, you can probably reduce your treatments to to annually – But you're still going to need multiple treatments down the line for that. So it doesn't take the place of a hair transplant, nor does it give you the volume. But we like to do it in conjunction with surgery because it definitely helps with healing, makes you heal quicker and things like that. Yeah. And it's just like we tell people with aging skin. I mean, you just get all these treatments to tighten up your skin and get rid of your wrinkles and you're getting your Botox and you're getting your fillers. But you're continuing to age. So as right. you're continuing to lose, you're going to continue to lose hair just as much as we're going to continue to develop wrinkles over time. So this is a commitment that patients have to make. This is not a once and done thing. If they want to do that, then they should most likely get a wig. But this is something that they have to have a commitment to, that they have to really embrace this from all angles and really do the research to make sure that they're going to the proper physician. Yeah. And and again, it's not that they have to do, um, you know, that everyone has to have multiple surgeries or, you know, surgery every year or anything like that. I mean, most patients will have one, two or three surgeries, depending on their extent of loss or how much hair they have at the time that they start because if they start relatively young you know you're not going to put hair just in case when they lose it you know you're doing it gradually so that it's not detectable specifically i deal with a lot of hollywood there's pictures of these people all the time so they start early so people really aren't recognizing that there's a change so that you can't really identify that something's happened um but you know it, it is fascinating the fact that we've moved from you know the large graphs to the very small natural looking graphs and the artistic way in which we do it we constantly improved the techniques the instrumentation for example now artists uh, it, which is the is the first and only robotic assisted transplant and an artist started out to help us harvest or to extract the hairs from the back of the head and it actually you can set parameters and identify where the best hairs to harvest from are and it will you can set the distance that you want them to be spread apart so that you continue to get a natural look and it actually averages the exit angle because when you're going in to punch a graft or to harvest a hair when you're doing the FUE, you can't see the bulb or the follicle below the surface of the skin. So if you transect it, it's not going to grow when you move it. So it's really important that you're able to identify it as best you can. And this actually measures all the angles 
at which it's exiting the scalp and then takes the average and allows you to make minor adjustments at the depth and so forth as to how you extract it. And you can even use the, the robot now to make incisions. And at the last aesthetic show that we, you and I were both at, they revealed for the first time that we can actually use this now for placement of graphs. So we can actually use the robot to actually in make an incision and at the same time place the graph into the incision and it's based on a design that the doctor has predetermined. So it's, it's really fascinating how, how technology uh, has grown and it mimics what we do as really, really solid physicians. And it's not to take the place of a physician, it's still assisted by, but the whole premise is to make it a little bit easier for both the patient and the doctor, but most importantly, it raises the bar and it also raises the floor. In other words, it sets parameters so that you really can't get bad work if you're using good technology. You can get, again, great work by anyone who's really, really good, but what we're trying to do is avoid nightmares for patients. And that's what I'm grateful for, the, the better technologies, because what they're trying to do is help patients with a problem, not create new problems for them. And that's, you know, so that's one of the interesting things with the technology and how that technology has moved. And this new robot, the artist IX, hasn't even been released yet, but, you know, it was demoed and we, we were able to demo it on how it will place the grafts, make the incision and place them. And and so, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the transplants for the top of the head and people automatically think we're mostly talking about men. My last four surgeries this week, all women, all yeah. women. So we do a lot more transplants for women. And, it, and it's a topic a lot of women don't talk about. You know, yeah. they don't talk about hair loss. I mean, they have it just as often as men do, and they don't realize that this is a solution for them as well. So I think in the, everybody out there, out there marketing this procedure for your companies, start marketing more to women because there's a big market out there. Yeah. And I think part of the reason that, that that's happening is because a lot more doctors are coming out and learning how to do FUE and not learning how to do the strip procedure or the FUT. And if you think about it, for FUE, you're diffusely thinning out the back of the head and you gotta shave the area. Uh -huh. And if you're gonna do a bigger session for women or, or patients that perhaps are transgender, and we do a lot of male to female transgender patients and you're gonna create a whole new female hairline, they're gonna need larger number of grafts. And you may not wanna diffusely thin out the back and if you're a woman with long hair, you may not want to shave a very large area because it's going to take a long time to get there. They may not be the best candidates for FUE. They're generally better candidates for FUT. Now, we certainly can do FUE for women and for, for some women are good candidates for it and have the option. But often FUT is the better procedure. And if you don't have the skill to do that, you're not really providing your patient with what I would you know, consider the proper ability to even give consent to have surgery because they're not getting all the treatment options presented to them. So you, you, to be a really good surgeon in hair restoration, you should know how to do FUT. You should know how to use FUE. You should be familiar with multiple devices for extracting the tissue. It, you know, you don't have to use a robot, but understand that the ro robot is available as well. And you've got to have really good staff and you have to be artistic because it is a not a one-for-one one exchange. You're using a small amount of hairs to give the impression of what was there. And this is not something that you hide. I mean, this is right there out on your, you know, your head and your face. For example, not only for women, you know, we do, we do the head. 50% um, of our females, we're doing this front band, this front zone and recreating the hairline. Some of them are for traction alopecia. We have a, a, a lot of African-American patients who have had the braiding and have lost the hair in the band here. But a lot of women who just have a, a, a high forehead and the proportions aren't right. And we create a nice natural hairline. And we're doing that on a regular basis now. It's even a better procedure most of the time than the forehead reduction procedures because that requires a shift where you're still going to have a scar in the front line. So that's going to be obvious to patients, and sometimes you have hair loss behind that. So this procedure is even better than that. But we do a lot of eyebrow procedures for men and women. We reconstruct the eyebrows, and we also do facial hair. And We just did a, a consult for a patient today who's going to do the facial hair, and we do a lot of that now. You know, Can you tell if this is real or not? I'm just kidding. 
No, I know you, so it's, I, it's always so I, real. I know it's, it's real. The question is if it's if it comes from the back or not. But. So those of you that, that don't really know Dr. Z, I met him at the Aesthetic Show years ago. We're both faculty at the Aesthetic Show, and I've met some fabulous uh, physicians out there that do some amazing things. And just like technology changes with me with lasers and what I like to do, because I'm a tattoo removal geek, that's what I like. You know, Dr. Zaring has been on the forefront of hair restoration. So it's nice to see technology constantly moving parallel in our fields. But like I said, you were the only person I wanted to talk to about this because I know the quality of work that you do. In fact, you've been on The Doctors right. and you've been on the Today Show, E! News. Oh. I have them all written down here. Good Morning America, Extreme Makeover, Good Day LA. And you're also on the Netflix series, Celebrity Plastic Surgeons of Beverly Hills. Yeah. Yeah, that's I've, a pretty I've, cool yeah. gig. I, I've, I've done now probably 23,000 surgeries. So by default, I think I have to be getting good at it. 23,000. Right? That's impressive. That's really yeah. impressive. So this is, you know, everybody that's listening here, you can hear how Dr. Z is so passionate about this. And this is the kind of physician that you want to look for. Somebody that this is what they do day in and day out. And they're in the pioneers on the forefront of this type of technology. It's always growing and it's always changing. Is there anything new that you wanted to talk to people about other than the artists? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always looking at um, in, in testing various injectables and different things to try to get more growth. And I, and I think that um, if people think something's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. So you need to get to look and ask some of those questions. But there's always going to be something new coming along. And you just have to – you don't want to wait so that you don't do anything. But you have to have a short and long-term plan for, for your hair loss. And you know I think that that's important. If someone tells you it's just a one-and-done situation, I think you got to be – at least get a second opinion. It can be, but most of the time it's not. And if someone says don't worry about future hair loss, unless you're in, in your twilight years you know, and you're talking triple digits – you potentially are going to lose more hair. I mean, even someone like uh, a David Letterman, who who uh, hopefully we're not dating ourselves too much, but David Letterman and I, I didn't say Johnny Carson, but they lost a lot of hair later on in life. And so it, it's conceivable that that happens down the line. But it's a really interesting field that a lot of movement, a lot of interest, and you can get good work from a lot of people as long as they are conscientious about what they're doing. They're up to date on the latest and greatest. You should be cautious of someone who just talks about one instrument and that's the only one they use. You know, that old adage of, you know, if all you have is a, a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. You know, hair loss, you need to make sure that people have more treatment options for you so that you don't get pigeonholed into doing something that maybe that doctor's best at, but isn't in your best interest. And so those of us that, that really are involved in this field are all about the education and trying to get it better and better for everyone because it's, it's fun. I mean, it's something that's fun to do and we get to help people while we're doing it. So it's ex exciting and we, and we love it. And, uh, you know, I, I love it. I'm, I'm learning all the time. My staff, you know, I, I like to think I'm one of the best surgeons in the world. And it's only because my staff is so good. They teach me all the time. And, you know, and I, I think that's, you know, once you start, stop, start stopping being w willing to learn things and try those new things, you know, you're done. Medicine evolves all the time. Just think back. You know, I, I remember thinking about just the, about the computers and I, I took computers in college. Now I'm really going to date myself to computers in college. And that was about writing programs, basic and Fortran. You say computers now, it's just, you know, my kids, everyone's got to have a computer just to go to class for high school. Okay, I'm dating myself because we didn't even have computers when I went to college, okay? <laughs> That's really bad. We didn't have them. But so, you know, your, your clinics are pretty much all over the United States are very accessible to a lot of people with all the different cities that you're in. So let everybody know what your URL is to your website. I'm sure you've got a lot of information that I've been on your website. It's really cool. Yeah. You want to go to www.zeringmedical.com and that's Z-I-E-R-I-N-G medical.com. And we're getting ready actually to do one more exciting thing that I want to talk about. Oh, great. Um, we're going to get involved more with patients that have been suffering with cancer. And people talk about that all the time. And there's misconceptions with regard to that. But there are certain things that we can do to try to help patients minimize the hair loss that comes with chemotherapy or some of the, the treatments that they have. And there's also patients who lose their hair after these treatments 
and then it comes back, but it, it actually, it's accelerating an underlying male or female pattern loss. And so they don't get all their hair back. And so it's interesting. They are cured of the cancer and they're in remission and there's no longer that but they have the hair loss and it acts as a psychological and physical reminder of that suffering. And so we're able to treat them with the hair transplant techniques that we have and actually kind of erase that. And it really is, a, you know, for me, a really gratifying step. And so you're going to see more from Zeering Medical as as we branch out and do more and more of this. And I'm, I'm real excited about this opportunity. That's really exciting. It sounds very rewarding and, and so generous of you to come up with something like that for patients. I know there's just so many different things that they go through. You know, I talked to my permanent makeup artist was on and she does the areola uh, reconstruction on breast reconstruction patients. And just to let a woman feel like like a woman again. And, you know, the same thing with hair loss. That's just a fascinating line that you're getting into. Yeah, I, I, I'm really excited about the crossover. And I, I think we do, we need to do more and more of that and offer more more things to more people because I, if so many patients come in, even just to talk about the eyebrows and say, what, what? you can transplant eyebrows? I didn't know about that. You really can do that? I mean, and, you know, it's something that we do all the time. So I, I think it's important that we share the information and, and, and the show that you're doing, I mean, is great because it gets it out there, gets it out on YouTube. People can see this in all these different avenues and really get educated appropriately. And so I thank you for, for doing that for everyone else. Well, you're welcome, Dr. Z. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to put this show together is because a lot of times, you know, we have this direct to consumer advertising all the time and they're hearing one side of the story, but they're really not hearing the story that comes from the physicians themselves that actually perform these procedures. I usually like these episodes to be very unbiased and they don't lean one way or another. And that's why I'm trying to bring on as many experts as possible. And I really thank you for sharing your expertise with our listeners. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, everyone, make sure you check out Dr. Zering's website. It's Zering Medical, Z-I-E-R-I-N-G medical.com. And like I said, he has offices in New York, Chicago, Las Vegas, Uh, Beverly Hills and Newport Beach, California. So he has a location somewhere near you. Make sure you go on his website. You can get some information on there. You can even, there's a form there where you can actually get on his mailing list and you can subscribe to a lot of his newsletters and get to know a lot more about what Dr. Z is doing for his patients. Thank you again, Dr. Z. It was so great to have you. My pleasure. All right. And everyone, make sure, you know, you listen to us. We're on Apple TV on the Living Sage Plastic Surgery Network. Also, another video will be on YouTube, but on audio, we will be on iHeartRadio, iTunes, SoundCloud, Tumblr, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, and you can even ask Alexa to play It's a Young Thing podcast in your device. So thank you all so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. You've been listening to It's a Young Thing with Nurse Paula Young. If we didn't discuss a topic you're interested in today, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes so when we do, you don't miss it. The Cosmetic aesthetic world can be confusing we're here to arm you with quality truthful information from our many years of experience for even more info youngmedicalspa.com this has been a steve mittenin social media creation steve mittenin social media.com the creators producers participants and distributors of this podcast disclaim any liability in connection with the material expressed herein this information should not be substituted for individual medical counseling information on this podcast is not intended to diagnose or prescribe treatment for any condition it is intended for educational purposes only based on the research and experience of young medical spa discussion of specific treatments is done only in an office visit directly with the patient contact our office to schedule